Recently, the question of crimes committed by the German army has been more closely examined. Bitter public disputes have encouraged new studies. The results are complex. Illegal orders were issued, crimes against humanity were committed, but there were also soldiers who followed the voice of their conscience. Newly discovered files of the British Secret Service, they reveal what the German military elite was really thinking. All the generals who became British prisoners of war had their conversations recorded round the clock. The 10,000 pages of transcripts offer a unique insight into the thinking of the German military elite. The men who had military responsibility for Hitler's war had always lived in a world apart. Shaped by World War I, they went on to serve a ruthless dictator. 84 of the Wehrmacht's 3,000 generals were housed in a luxury prisoner of war camp, Trent Park, near London. Their conversations reveal what they really thought, thanks to the hidden microphones of the British Secret Service. General Heinrich Eberbach is a prisoner here, so too is his son Eugen, a hardliner. But Heinrich Eberbach is beginning to have doubts. The British Secret Service were astonished by so much frankness. You might go as far as to say the million Jews, or however many of them we've killed, well, that had to be in the interests of our nation. But the women and children, that was unnecessary. That's where we went too far. Well, if Jews have to go, then the women and children do too, or at least the children. You don't have to do it in public. But what good does it do just to get rid of the old people? It's too inhumane. How many Polacks have we killed? We killed at least one million of them. How many did we kill in Yugoslavia? I never knew about that. I was never part of that. How many Russians have we killed? Not just Poles. Like Heinrich Eberbach, many generals are plagued by guilt. Historian Zönke Neitzel discovered and evaluated the transcripts. He found a revealing openness in the conversations of these high-ranking prisoners. The generals in Trent Park were in a very special situation. Their old reference points in the Wehrmacht and the Third Reich had been ripped away, and they hadn't yet got to the Federal Republic. So this was an interim period. They were disorientated and had to get new bearings with no firm references. They were able to think freely, more freely than ever before, and also more freely than afterwards. So it was a unique situation, and that's why these documents have a very special value. The prisoners at Trent Park talked more about war crimes than any other subject. They recognized the gravity of these crimes against humanity, and that occupied their thoughts, because they ran counter to a certain set of values which the generals would otherwise have respected. On the other hand, they were involved. They were part of the Wehrmacht. They had the power of command. How do you reconcile the two? That agonizing question preoccupied the generals for months and years. The war in the East was to become a war of unprecedented barbarity. Many Wehrmacht soldiers find themselves in fierce combat for the first time. They told us the Russians were pigs, that they didn't take prisoners, that they gouged prisoners' eyes out, things like that. We got to hear that kind of horror propaganda, but nothing else. Horror propaganda. Peter Schilling grew up well protected in a parsonage. At 18, he volunteered enthusiastically for the Wehrmacht, even though his parents were anti-Nazi. 
I wanted to join the Navy. One of my uncles was a captain. He went on to become a rear admiral. I wanted to become an officer. I wanted to wear one of those smart caps, but I was rejected because at that time the Navy only wanted people who had perfect vision, but I was a little short-sighted. Six months later, they would have welcomed me with open arms, but by that time, I didn't want to. Max Gotthard grew up as an orphan in Hamburg. It was a tough upbringing, but all the hard knocks of childhood couldn't prepare him for the experience of war, like losing your best friend. He was a friend from Dusseldorf, and we had to secure some stupid hill. We had to get up it. He was caught in a burst of machine gun fire and was shot through from top to bottom. And I threw up. Later, I got used to it, but that was hard. Wilhelm Keitel, chief of the armed forces high command, had issued his notorious commissar order before the Russian campaign had even started. It called for the execution of Red Army political commissars as soon as they were captured. The commissars were political propagandists. They enforced discipline in Soviet ranks, if necessary, by force. They could be identified by the red star on their sleeve. Our company commander read us the order that evening, saying he was duty-bound to do so. And then he said something more, and I remember it well because we all felt it showed great courage. He said, I have read you this because I have to. What you make of it is between you and your conscience. And we thought this was a really great, clear statement against an order. And we had great respect for our company commander after saying something like that. Only a few soldiers can or want to remember that the commissar order was actually carried out. Every morning, the commissars were separated from the other prisoners, and then they were shot. There were these old trenches in which they had to sit down. I believe it was a police unit, not our people, that did the shooting. For a long time, it was said that the commissar order was only carried out in exceptional cases. But just recently, a young historian has taken the time to check the records of compliance or non-compliance with the order. While the campaign was underway, German troops demonstrated their willingness to obey the Commissar order. The German files reveal that all the armies all the Army Corps and over 80% of German divisions complied with the Commissar order. That is, there is evidence of Commissar executions in the files. And that was true of the 6th Army, commanded by Field Marshal Walter van Reichenau. His father had been a Prussian general and he became an officer after high school. He met Hitler in 1932, before the Nazis came to power, and he was soon an enthusiastic supporter. Being a loyal party member makes him an exception among the generals. In autumn 1939, Reichenau learns that Hitler intends to invade France. They discuss the plan several times. Historian Tim Richter has studied Reichenau's career for several years. He has made some interesting discoveries. 
Als einer der wenigen Reichenau was one of the few high-ranking officers who realized that it was important to have direct access to Hitler. Many others thought it was beneath their dignity, or they said, we don't want anything to do with politics, we have enough to do looking after rearmament. So there were frequent meetings between Reichenau and Hitler. Reichenau tries to talk Hitler out of his plans on military grounds. He fails, and Hitler is annoyed. After Hitler gave a speech to his generals, in which he made it clear he was determined to attack, Reichenau contacted a leader of the civilian resistance, Karl Gödeler, in Leipzig. And they came to the conclusion that an attack by Germany in the West in 1939 would be a disaster. And the only way to prevent it was to make the plans known. After the meeting, Gerdeler leaks Reichenau's information to the British government. Reichenau is prepared to commit treason in order to counter Hitler's decision. But just 18 months later, Reichenau shows a completely different side in the Russian campaign. Bila Tserkva in the Ukraine, mid-August 1941. Reichenau's 6th Army advances into the town and takes it without a battle. Special units of the SS begin to murder Jewish civilians. And then on the radio there was an announcement. They said that from now on every Jew had to wear a symbol. They were forced to wear a Star of David. And then two or three or perhaps even four weeks later, I was only 12 years old then, they were rounded up and herded away to be shot. They killed the Jews. My mother and I saw this column of people walking down the street one day. More than 800 Jews were shot dead in Bila Tserkva. The Wehrmacht's field command supplied logistic support for mass murder. I saw this and I thought, why are the people in the front doing somersaults? Doing somersaults and disappearing. There's a row of people standing there and they're all doing somersaults at the same time. What's all that about? That's what I was thinking. Then I went closer and I saw that they'd been shot and had fallen into the ditch. What should be done with the 90 children left over? For the time being, they're locked up in a schoolroom. An army driver takes a few officers over to investigate. I see the children, small children, two or three years old or 10 or 12 years old, and they were dressed in rags. Most of the children we saw in Russia were dressed like that. They may have been in there for three or four days or two days or five days. They didn't scream or yell or anything. They were very quiet there in the room where we were. Lieutenant Colonel Helmut Grosskut, a staff officer with the division that made its headquarters in the town, writes this report. The rooms were filled with about 90 children. There was an indescribable amount of filth. Rags, diapers, refuse lay everywhere. Countless flies covered the children, some of whom were naked. Almost all the children were crying or whimpering. The stench was unbearable. In the above-mentioned case, Measures were taken against women and children which were no different from atrocities committed by the enemy. Grosskut insists that 6th Army headquarters make a decision. Are the children who are imprisoned without provisions really going to be murdered? Talks are held. Grosskut is granted a postponement. Now the decision is in the hands of Walter van Reichenau, commander-in-chief of the 6th Army. Killing small children poses no problem for him. He issues the order to Grosskut in writing. I have decided, as a matter of principle, that once such an action is started, it should be carried out in an expedient fashion. All the children are murdered. Soon afterwards, Reichenau issues an order covering the conduct of troops in the Eastern Territories. 
He speaks of the war of annihilation, the Asiatic Jewish threat, and the pitiless extermination of alien treachery. Ugly words, which had ugly consequences. The effect of the order can be seen especially clearly in the records of 6th Army units. The number of executions of civilians and partisans carried out by 6th Army units after the Reichenau order soared dramatically. It's not known how many frontline soldiers knew about the work of the murder squads. However, quite apart from the Reichenau order, there were so many executions and so many victims it was impossible to keep them a secret. With the massacre of the children of Bilatzelkva and his provocative order that followed, Reichenau has distinguished himself as a loyal Nazi. Within months, he's promoted to Commander-in-Chief Army Group South, apparently back in favor with Hitler. the eastwards advance continues. The 6th Army marches to the Volga. The 11th Army moves further south, towards the Crimea. Dietrich von Koltitz is a colonel in the 11th Army. Born on an estate in Silesia, he entered the Cadet Corps at the tender age of 13. He will be captured in August 1944. Koltitz was certainly a very able general who quickly progressed in his career. He was a fighting soldier. He'd been on the front line since 1940 and had fought very successfully. He was a man who showed remarkable insight, but he was an irascible man and was rather convinced of his own importance. So he soon made himself unpopular in Trent Park and none of his colleagues really wanted to have anything to do with him. So wirklich was zu tun haben. Like many other generals in British captivity, he talked almost compulsively about the crimes he'd witnessed. At the end of the Crimean campaign, Colonel von Koltitz, later promoted to general, briefly returned to Germany. On the way home, he experienced something that's still on his mind years later. I arrived one day, sometime after the fall of Sevastopol. The airfield commander came over to me, and I could hear gunshots. Are you doing an exercise, I asked. <laughs> and he said, for heaven's sake, I can't talk here. They've been shooting Jews for days. The Crimean Peninsula plays an important role in Hitler's racial obsession. For once in the distant past, a German tribe, the Goths, had settled here. Now most of the ethnic groups are to be deported from the region, and the Jews are to be executed. In the British Secret Service recordings, General von Koltitz seriously incriminates himself. The most difficult assignment I have ever carried out, with the greatest thoroughness, I might add, is the liquidation of the Jews. I fulfilled this assignment with ultimate conviction. There's a thriving Jewish community in the port city of Sebastopol. As soon as the Germans occupy the city, SS Special Task Force D begins its persecution of the Jews, often with the support of the Wehrmacht. The house we lived in had people of all nationalities. There were Jews, Greeks, everything imaginable. I was friends with one family. The boy and I went to school together. He was Jewish, and his name was Yakov, and his family name was Trevas. He was in the parallel class to me. When the Germans came, 
When the Germans arrived, they posted announcements everywhere. All the Jews were to register at the Commandant's office. After that, the Jews were rounded up for execution. I told Yakov that I would hide him, but he didn't want to leave his parents on their own. Yakov did not survive. Historian Norbert Kuntz has studied events in the Crimea during the war. Until the German invasion, about 65,000 Jews lived in the Crimea. Many of those were able to escape before the Germans arrived. But other Jews came to the Crimea from Odessa. From various statistical sources, we know that up to 35,000 East European Jews, along with 3,000 Crimean Tatars, who were included with the Jews, and about 100 mountain Jews of Azerbaijan plus 2,000 gypsies, were captured by the Germans and did not survive to the end of the German occupation in 1944. Few of the execution sites are known today. As far as the Holocaust is concerned, it is undisputed that the majority of these crimes were committed by the SS, by the special task forces. But without the Wehrmacht, a crime on this scale would not have been possible. The Wehrmacht supported the Holocaust, sometimes passively, sometimes actively. Without the Wehrmacht, this genocide would not have taken place. At the small town of Krupki in White Russia, Wehrmacht units take part in the murder of Jews. A former infantry soldier remembers. The evening before, our platoon leader, Lieutenant Haider, or Haiber, or whatever his name was, came and said, boys, tomorrow we have a tough job to do. Anyone who doesn't want to do it, doesn't have to. No one came forward and said, I'm not going to do it. And in the middle of the night, around 2 a.m., the whole of Krupki was surrounded by riflemen and by our machine gun company. We went into the houses and said, get out, get down to the market square. The Jews are herded out of the town to nearby marshland. There were really deep swamp ditches deep ditches as big as a room and all of a sudden we heard everyone halt soldiers step back they brought us to this ditch and they said we're going to shoot you now in family groups they had to go down a steep embankment and then they had to sit with their heads down and the deep trenches were behind them and then about 10 people at a time had to take off their outer clothes and one group after the other had to stand in front of the ditches. Wehrmacht soldiers guard the execution site while the executions take place. The edges of the mass graves are lined with planks. And the families stood there between the boards and hugged each other while the Germans fired. He had some kind of little weapon and he fired and the people fell into the ditches. They were always shot in the neck and tumbled down into the ditches, one on top of the other. Miraculously, Sofia Shalaumova survives the shooting. They're shooting, the people are falling into the ditches, and then it's our turn. I can't tell you whether I fell into the ditch on purpose or if it was an accident. In any case, I was alive when I fell in. Nobody notices she's still alive. She manages to escape the mass grave before it's covered over and hidden for the rest of the war. Work detail.
often a code name for execution. In Trent Park, Heinrich Kittel tells a typical story about something he witnessed in Latvia. He's anti-Semitic and loyal to the regime, but full of arrogance and disgust towards the special task forces of the SS. The orderly said to me, Colonel, you should go there. There's something to see. I just stood nearby. That was enough for me. 300 men were driven out of Duneborg, and they dug a pit. The following day, they returned, men, women, and children. They were counted, and then they were forced to undress. Then 20 of the women had to stand close to the edge of the pit, naked. They were then shot and fell down into it. How was it done? They were facing the pit. Our men came up close to them and shot them through the head. One man gave the command, and 20 people fell into the pit like clay pigeons. I went back to the car, and turned to the SS man in charge, and said to him, I forbid you once and for all to do these shootings outside where everyone can watch. If you shoot them in the woods or anywhere else where nobody can see it, it's up to you. But we get our drinking water out of the wells here, and we can definitely do without corpse water. General Kittel protests against the execution of Jews, but only because its secrecy cannot be guaranteed and because he sees a threat to his soldiers' drinking water. In reality, the reserve units of the Wehrmacht largely cooperate in the mass murders. It becomes evident in Trent Park that the Wehrmacht was involved in all of the major war crimes committed by the Third Reich. The prisoners talk about the Holocaust and about the Wehrmacht's involvement in the Holocaust. They talk about the murder of Soviet prisoners of war and about the Wehrmacht's involvement in that. They speak about euthanasia, the killing of hostages, etc. And it becomes clear in these conversations that these weren't crimes committed only by the SS, the Gestapo and the security service, but that the Wehrmacht played a leading role in these crimes. And yet from the very beginning, the officers and generals of the Wehrmacht try to unload responsibility for the executions onto the SS. In their luxurious prisoner of war camp, they prepare their line of defense. The SS did things unworthy of an officer during the mass executions. Things that every German officer should have refused to do. It would be politically desirable for the German officer called to say, to say, we have nothing to do with these people, but I'm not sure. We would get very far by saying that. They could immediately reply, oh yes, Captain, what's his name? is a German army officer. Colonel Watsit is an officer. And they did exactly as the SS have done. When I am asked to testify, whatever I say, I intend to twist it in such a way that the officer call is cleared off everything. I'm absolutely determined. It is still not known how many Wehrmacht soldiers were involved in the crimes. Even if, as conservative estimates indicate, it was only 5%. On the Eastern Front alone, that would be 500,000 men. According to Nazi ideology, Russians, Jews and other minorities are subhuman. The greatest enemy is Jewish Bolshevism. And many Wehrmacht soldiers take these beliefs literally. General Wilhelm von Thoma, one of the more self-critical of the generals at Trent Park, gives a shocking example. And then the captain says to the lieutenant, damn, I can't stand seeing these farmyard faces anymore. Takes out his revolver and shoots the farmer who he had personally invited over and blows him across the table. But he was severely punished for it. The captain. Just wait a moment. The woman screams boo murder, sits herself on the stove with her children and starts crying. The captain then says to the lieutenant, see to it 
that I can get some peace and quiet. He draws his revolver and shoots the woman. There's still the girl, a 10-year-old boy and a two-month-old little baby. Suddenly, yep, she's got to go too. And he just shoots the girl. Now it's a 10-year-old boy's turn. The captain says, take him outside and shoot him. He was killed by a shot to the neck. Now there was just the two months old little baby left on the stove. Then he said, get that animal out. He chucked it down, grabbed his food and threw it out into the snow. I had them court-martialed. The captain just said, we didn't shoot any human beings. I asked for the death penalty for both of them, a public execution shot by their own company. They weren't punished. They were just sent to some punishment battalion. A minority of soldiers like Friedrich Hassenstein are appalled by this coarsening of human nature. Many happily used these race theories as a pretext to do things they would never have done as civilians and thereby revealed their hidden inclinations towards sadism and violence. There were very many of them and I'm afraid that all paints a very pessimistic picture. Peter Schilling doesn't want to be party to this any longer. He takes action. He drives to the Swiss border. I lay a little bit above the road, at the edge of a forest, and I watch the road. I believe I saw one or two patrols and had identified a certain rhythm. Here comes a patrol, and it will probably be a quarter of an hour before the next patrol, or something like that. And I thought, I have to get down, jump onto the road, cross the road, go through the barbed wire, and it wasn't just a fence of barbed wire, but a real maze of wire. I had to crawl in there, and I knew from the moment I crawl in, I can't nip right and left anymore, and then they can pick me off like a rabbit. And that was really, really horrible. That's the only time I was terribly afraid and trembling with fear. After I had crawled through, I grabbed a fallen branch and banged it against a tree and yelled like a crazy man, here I am, here I am, you can't get me anymore. I was on the Swiss side. While Peter Schilling is making his bolt for freedom, in the east, Soviet POWs are systematically being starved. About half the six million Soviet prisoners die of hunger. The German generals, now themselves prisoners, know they are guilty. During the winter of 1941 and 42, at least three to four million people died of starvation. They gave them too little to eat. That was the great crime. They are human beings. Even a Russian is a human being, damn it! We acted like wild beasts, not like civilized people. In Yugoslavia, attacks by partisans and snipers are feared more than anything else, especially since the Serbian uprising in the fall of 1941. The Wehrmacht responds on its own initiative, largely without the participation of the SS and with extreme violence. Frequently, civilians are arbitrarily selected and killed. It violates all the rules of war, but it happens every day. Colonel Eberhard Wildemuth was a witness. In Trent Park, he describes this unpleasant period to a fellow officer. In Serbia, I was ordered to have 100 people shot for every dead German, and 50 people for every wounded German. 
but I never carried out the order. In one Serbian town, when the commandant had two dead and three wounded, he rounded up 350 people and shot 200 Serbs for the dead men and 150 for the wounded. About 2,400 people were shot there. But these are things that didn't have to happen. Because I allowed this order to be carried out, for example. They got me for that. And they say, you passed this order on. And I say, well, I had to. Otherwise, I would have been shot. That's my defense. But morally, it's certainly no defense at all. In Panchevo, not far from Belgrade, the situation is especially volatile in April 1941. So-called ethnic Germans live here, and nine have been killed by sniper fire during the Wehrmacht invasion. The night before their burial, someone shoots at Wehrmacht soldiers. Two are fatally wounded. 38 inhabitants of the town are arbitrarily arrested. A summary court-martial under the administration of the local Wehrmacht commander sentences 36 of them to death. There is no proof of their guilt. The condemned men, 18 of them were to be shot and 18 hanged, were taken to the cemetery by armed ethnic Germans from Panchevo. A unit of German soldiers were lined up in rows there, waiting for them. The Wehrmacht generals held at Trent Park were completely clear that they had violated fundamental rules of humanity, at least according to Ferdinand Heim, longtime chief of staff to General von Reichenau. One of his fellow prisoners tells him about Babi Yar near Kiev, where both had served. Special task forces there had murdered more than 30,000 Jews. Even if the figures are incorrect, I think that these are things that can be referred to as criminal, or even as completely mad and insane. Just as I have responsibilities to my family and to my nation, naturally I also have to observe certain rules of humanity. There is absolutely no doubt about that. I can't just behave like a wild animal. General von Koltitz, who had been a field commander on the Eastern Front like Reichenau, had always distanced himself from Hitler and his party. As a prisoner of war, he takes time to reflect and is the only one to say out loud what the others hardly dare to think, that the generals did not live up to their responsibilities. We all share the guilt. We went along with everything. And we half took the Nazi seriously, instead of saying, to hell with you and your stupid nonsense. I misled my soldiers into believing this rubbish. I feel utterly ashamed of myself. Perhaps we bear even more guilt than these uneducated animals. The ordinary soldiers who put their lives on the line are often not up to the moral and mental demands made on them. As the war goes on, their inhibitions are progressively released. Max Gotthard had already witnessed the harsh realities of war in France. He's now serving in Italy. The soldiers are engaged in a fighting retreat since Mussolini was deposed and Italy broke off its alliance with Germany, the Allies have been advancing from the southern tip of Italy. The Germans are constantly under attack from partisans. We 
Afterwards, during our retreat, we had a major vegan. He was a first-class coward. In northern Italy, it must have been north of Florence, he sent the men of the villages to forced labor in Germany in order to win this or that woman and things like that. I know that for a fact. How many of them were partisans, I don't know. But then, of course, the partisans took their revenge whenever they caught someone. The Wehrmacht's constant fight against the partisans is no solution. Rather, it's the source of the problem. We would find three of the lads with their throats cut, but we never caught anyone. The partisans knew their way around in the terrain, and we didn't. That was their big advantage. In Tuscany, at the headwaters of the river Arno, shots are occasionally exchanged with the partisans. On April the 11th, 1944, two Germans are killed. In such cases, the Wehrmacht always respond in the same way. Then we would hear, fall in and search. So the area was searched systematically, and anyone who was caught was killed on the spot. At dawn, on April the 13th, 1944, soldiers of the Hermann Göring division surround the scattered groups of houses of the village of Baluccioli. It was around six in the morning. I heard the door open. There were two of them. Come on, come on, come on, they said. They dragged me out. I was the first one out of our building. They kicked me all the way down to the piazza. I see all the people. Everyone's afraid. I see my aunt holding her child, holding him tightly. And standing over her, a man with a gun. And he shot them. Then there was a boy, 10 or 12 years old perhaps, I don't know exactly. He was standing up very straight. And someone came over with his pistol too. My grandmother died in the house of my neighbor, Tonielli. My mother died in the living room, and my wife between the toilet and the bathroom cabinet, and the child she was holding with his arms wrapped round her neck. By evening, 108 civilians lie dead, among them 43 women and 22 children. This is not an isolated case. Soldiers of the Wehrmacht killed 10,000 civilians in Italy. Max Gotthardt was only a witness at such atrocities, but his final analysis is extremely self-critical. As a young man, I was optimistic. I'd always been interested in literature, in music, and all those things. And now I had to go to war and came back a murderer. People are destroyed. And so is the spirit of civilization. With the Allies poised to enter Paris, Hitler issues an absurd order. Paris must not fall into the enemy's hands, but if it does, he must find nothing but a field of ruins. Dietrich von Koltitz is now Wehrmacht commander in Paris. He is to carry out the order, as he recalls in Trent Park. Flatten Paris with 500 men. Those were my orders. I was also given that order. Paris is to be flattened. All the bridges are to be blown up. Yes, the man is insane. General von Koltitz defies Hitler's order. Taken prisoner in Paris, he's treated well. Shortly before his surrender, he had secretly arranged a truce with the French resistance. This is the same man who, by his own admission, allowed Jews to be murdered. Sometimes good and evil are not far apart. He wouldn't have had the resources to destroy Paris anyway. He tells his fellow prisoners how he responded to the destruction order. I said, I have no cannons. I have no explosives. All I have is his useless bow and arrow, the 98 infantry rifle. Yesterday morning, when I handed over 
I could see only one machine gun firing. But how I'm supposed to set the louvre on fire with that, or raise the Chambre de Dupité to the ground, I'm not quite sure. There was resistance to Hitler in the higher ranks of the Wehrmacht as well. Was it the atrocities they had witnessed that forced them to act? Or was it the changing course of the war? Resistance is the subject of the Wehrmacht tomorrow at 5 on the History Channel, where next Frontline continues with the battlefield detectives at Pointe du Hoc.